Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and today we continue our verse by verse study through the book of Revelation. We are in Revelation chapter 15, and we resume our study in verse number 5. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you are able, follow along in your own copy of Scripture as I read the Bible verse by verse. Let's begin with our reading in Revelation chapter 15, verse 1. And remember, this is the Apostle John who has been caught up to heaven, and uh, he is seeing all sorts of visions and receiving revelations from God, and uh, many of them pertain to the end days, the last days before Jesus returns. Verse 1, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the last, the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. When God is finished pouring out his wrath on this world of his in the final days, his wrath will be completed. It will be finished forever. He will never be angry again, as I mentioned last time. Verse 2. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name, they held harps given them by God and sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, and these are Christians seen in heaven, very happy. And this is what they sang to Jesus. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And now verse 5. After this I looked, and in heaven the temple, that is, the tabernacle of the testimony, was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen, and wore golden sashes around their chests. So John sees seven angels coming out of the, th the throne room of God, as it were. And it says in verse 7, Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until... The seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. The Bible says that judgment is God's strange work. In other words, God does not like to punish sinners. He will. He must. Because he is just. But he would rather not. So notice in verse 5. God is preparing to pour out his wrath on sinners in the final days. And as he prepares, he removes everyone from his temple. It's as if God wants to be alone as he sends his angels out to punish his rebellious world. This is not a pleasant thing for God to do, but it must be done. And so we begin in chapter 16. John writes, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, and this is obviously God, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. And here's number one, verse two. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. In other words, on those who refused to repent 
and rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So God's end time wrath begins with painful sores. Painful sores come upon all who have refused to repent and receive Christ. God's patience has run out. And these people, no doubt, were sure they were absolutely convinced that they could sin and get away with it. But God's wrath is just getting started. And they're already in tremendous pain. Verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. So immediately after the painful sores, God turns all seawater, all the waters in every ocean, into blood. Thick, coagulating blood of a dead man chokes the life out of all the fish and all the creatures of the sea. This is God's wrath. This is his end time wrath. And if you were in outer space and you looked down, earth would no longer be the blue planet. It would be the red planet, blood red. Verse 4. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. It began with the painful sores on all Christ-rejecting, impenitent sinners. And then the oceans were filled with blood. And that, then, is quickly followed by judgment number three. All the rivers, and all the streams, and all the lakes of the world, the entire freshwater supply of the world, becomes blood. There is no fresh water anywhere. And by the way, these final seven judgments happen in rapid fire succession, like a machine gun. And they leave the earth reeling right before Jesus returns. Blood will flow from every well and every faucet. Can you imagine the stench of death, the stench of blood, the horrible pain, and obviously the severe thirst? It's going to come upon this world in the final days. This is punishment for sin. This is God doing what he can no longer put off. And really, he's just getting started. Verse 5. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. So an angel, in the midst of these severe punishments from God, an angel interjects this word of praise to God, an affirmation. He says, this is what sinful man deserves. God, you are doing what is right. Bad people who refuse to change, and even refuse to take God up on his offer of mercy through Jesus Christ, they will be punished. Of course that's the right thing to do. What more could God possibly do than what he has done? He came to earth himself to die and pay for their sins. They don't even take him up on that offer. They just want to sin. They deserve this, every bit of it, and more. And there's more to come. The angel continues in verse 6, For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. The world will persecute and murder countless numbers of Christians toward the end of time. The wicked will have a thirst for innocent blood, for the blood of Christians, and blood they will get. It's as if God says, you want blood? I'll give you blood. They'll have more blood than they bargained for. They'll have blood to drink. If they're thirsty, they're going to be drinking blood. And that blood represents all the innocent blood of Christians, which wicked people have shed over the years, especially in the last days. Those who 
received pleasure from persecuting Christians and killing Christians and those who approved of the persecution and the killing of Christians and just Christ rejecting sinners in general from all over the world will choke and gag on blood. You wanted blood? Okay, you've got blood. Verse 7. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. True and just are God's judgments. What he is doing is correct. And the laughter of Christ rejecting sinners has been turned into mourning. And it is exactly what they deserve. God is pouring out his wrath. And that's his business. That's his job, not ours. Obedient Christians do not get even with those who hurt them. Because they know that God says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Our job is to love the sinners, even love those who hurt us. Vengeance is God's business. And he is seen taking care of that business in this verse. You don't have to get that person back. You don't have to get even. Look at these verses. God is taking care of business. Christians should want bad people to repent. Christians should pray for their repentance and for them to be forgiven through Jesus Christ and for them to avoid punishment. God will take care of the punishment part when he has to. Verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. And the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. Did you ever see a scorched kettle? Or frying pan? Coffee pot? Something like that? Well, imagine having scorched skin. The unsaved are going to get a taste of hell during the final days when God turns up the temperature of the sun and it literally fries their skin. It fries their skin black. So you can now add scorched skin to their painful sores and to the stench of death and the blood and the thirst. They are in hell's waiting room and it's not a very pleasant place. It's only going to get worse. Verse 9 They were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues but they refused to repent and glorify him they will remain defiant just as some sinners remain defiant today no matter what happens to them they don't get it they don't turn in repentance and they don't receive the mercy that God is offering through Jesus Christ. And that's the way the entire population of the world is going to be in the final days. With the exception of Christians, of course. They remain defiant. They are in pain. They are burning. They are choking on blood. They are thirsty. And they can't escape any of these things. It just keeps getting worse and worse. They know that God is doing it to them. They know he is punishing them for their sins, and yet they still refuse to repent. They shake their fist at God and they curse him. They don't understand that even in this, God is being gracious to them. Because God could have killed them and sent them to hell immediately. But he didn't. God instead is giving them a taste of hell. God is giving them a chance to say, I don't want any part of your wrath, God. This is, this is too severe. I can't handle it. Lord, I repent. I want Jesus to save me. I want to be forgiven. That's why God is doing it in stages. But they refuse to repent. What more could God possibly do? Verse 10. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness notice this and men gnawed their tongues in agony the heat of the sun is turned up but the light of the sun is turned off 
and there's no relief. Not to any of their sufferings. And the pain is maddening. You can tell it is. They grind their tongue with their teeth because when you're in as much pain as they are, you've got to do something. Every muscle in their body is flexed because the pain has caused so much tension. You've got to do something. And the only thing they can do is grind their tongues with their teeth. There's a way out. But they refuse to take it. Repenting and receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior would save them, but they won't do it. They'd rather suffer than serve. They'd rather writhe in pain than honor their Creator. They are getting what they deserve, and this is just the beginning. Wait till they hit eternity. Verse 10 again, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores but they refused to repent of what they had done they refused to repent when your sin is killing you and it's about to send you to hell and you know it and you still won't repent? And you still curse God? You've just about reached the point of no return. You're not even dead yet. And you've just about reached the point of no return. On a scale of 1 to 10, the hardness of your heart at this point is 9.999. And that is the danger of not repenting when one feels guilt over sin. The warning isn't just for people who live in the final days. This warning is for us today. When a person feels guilt over their sin and they know that Jesus Christ is the only way to receive forgiveness but they don't repent and they don't ask Jesus Christ to save their soul their heart will grow a little bit harder. And if that continues, they will eventually get to the point where they won't repent even though their sin is killing them and they are on the very edge of hell. Verse 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, that's the devil, out of the mouth of the beast, the Antichrist, and the mouth of the false prophet, his PR man. The unholy trinity, they have been called. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Notice how the people begin to fight with each other. That shouldn't surprise us. When people don't get along with God, they won't get along with each other either. Oh, I know sinners can get along just fine with each other, as long as everything is going fine. But they quickly turn mean and selfish when things are not going well. Notice 14 again. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. And here we see a demonically inspired war. The Bible tells us why wars occur. Because we want what doesn't belong to us and we take it. And we, we want what we don't have and we take it from somebody else. Boy, that's sinful man for you. When lust for evil can no longer be satisfied by what one has, they will take what belongs to someone else. They'll just take it. And they'll use that as well. And of course, demons are always willing to give sinners a little nudge or a big nudge, whatever is needed to create more bad. And they certainly will do that in the final days. And then right in the middle of all this bad, Jesus 
interjects an encouraging word to his people in verse 15. Behold, he says, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake, keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. And when he talks about his clo- or our clothes and not walking around without any clothes on, he's speaking figuratively here. What Jesus is saying in verse 15 to his people is, keep the faith. Don't quit. Don't let up. Even when it gets extremely hard, keep the faith and don't quit. Jesus is saying, stay holy. Do not become lukewarm concerning Jesus Christ. Because he comes like a thief. you got to hang in there until the end. By the grace of God, you never know. You may be standing before him before this day is over. Again, this warning isn't just for the people in the final days. This, this warning is for all Christians of every age. Hang in there. Keep the faith. No coasting allowed in Christianity. Coasting, spiritually speaking, is very dangerous. There's a reason that the Christian life is compared to a wrestling match by the Apostle Paul. If you've ever wrestled, you know you have to stay flexed. If you relax your muscles, you're going to get pinned. Coasting is dangerous. Coasting leads to spiritual coolness, which leads to spiritual coldness and loss of holiness and eventually loss of faith. So stay on top of things is what Jesus is telling us to do right here. Verse 16. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Many people have heard of Armageddon. It's going to be the last world war in the final days before Jesus returns. So we see from this that war will continue right up until the time that Jesus returns. As long as there are bad people, there will be war. There will be trouble. It's good to work for peace. That's a lofty goal. But just keep in mind that lasting peace won't happen until Jesus returns. Good people have to keep their guard up because there are bad people. And somebody might say, well, you're too pessimistic. No, I'm a realist. Think about it. People can't get along in their families. Neighbors fight. How friendly are people when they get cut off in traffic? It is human, sinful nature to fight and to argue and to cause strife. Sinful human beings cause strife. Well, nations are made up of sinful human beings. War is just strife on a bigger scale. We're going to have it until the very end. 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, And out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. God says, It is done. You say, What is done? Well, take a look at what has transpired in these last couple of days of earth. And then ask the question, What is done? Life, as people know it, is done. Things will never be the same. Life is as it has been for sinful man, is finished. God here is about to drive the final nail in this sinful world's coffin. Verse 18. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the Great. Remember, that's the ungodly world system. And gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Notice this. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. Verse 21. From the sky, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men. Stop there for a second. God is seen smashing his world to pieces. 
literally smashing his world to pieces. If there was anything left after the first six plagues, it's been smashed with the seventh. Everything that man has put before God lies in ruins. That new car, that new computer, that new television, whatever it might be, your new RV, it all lies in ruins. Everything that man has put their hope in is destroyed. There is no future. There is no hope. There is no happiness for those who reject the Savior. This is their end. And this is the end of the world. Notice 21 again. From the sky, huge hailstones of about a 100 pounds each fell upon men, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. They blamed God for their suffering. They blame God for their punishment. But they are to blame. For thousands of years, God has warned about Judgment Day. Since the very beginning, God has warned that He would punish those who refuse to repent. And for thousands of years, people have scoffed at God and rejected His word and laughed at it and mocked Him and mocked the idea of His wrath and Judgment Day. But there will be no scoffing and there will be no laughter on this day. Those who reject God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will experience the loss of all that is good and they will enter an eternity of complete bad that will never end. Questions, comments, write me. Scripture verse by verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, Wisconsin. 54402-2211 That's Scripture Verse by Verse Post Office Box 2211 WASA 54402-2211 If you would rather email me, you can do that. I can be emailed at vbyvmm at aol.com That's vbyvmm at aol.com Or you can call 715 715- Eight four five eight two nine eight. That's seven one five eight four five eight two nine eight. If you want to study the Word of God further, you can study the entire Bible online for free using my audio Bible commentaries. Just pick a book of the Bible, chapter, and go through it with me verse by verse. Using my audio Bible commentaries, you can do that. The web address is moret.org. That's M E U R. E-T-T dot O-R-G again M-E-U-R-E-O-R-G I'd love to hear from you and if you're looking for a place to worship you can come and join us we meet Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock at Island Place which is right next to Oak Island here in Wausau that's 10 o'clock Sunday mornings Island Place right next to Oak Island here in Wausau thanks for spending this time with me I'm with you every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock here on 1230 WXO. until next time So long, everyone.